So we used to go to this church in Philadelphia, and we did this uh, basketball league thing, and we were just trying to figure out a way to reach the community, and we did a, a survey. We hired a research company to tell us, like, what does the community really want that maybe the church could offer? And it was unbelievable, the results. It was overwhelming. Parents wanted things for their kids that were safe and that weren't so crazy. Rec sports, community sports in the area had gotten a little nuts. Um, parents screaming at the refs and coaches only playing certain players if they had parents who had certain things and politics were being played and kids weren't getting playing time and threats were being made from the stands at football games and it was just a weird time in Philly rec sports. And the company said to us, your community is hungry to have something safe for their kids. And we found this ministry based out of the South called Upward Basketball. And uh, then they started Upward Volleyball and Soccer and Flag Football. And, and they just provided this alternative. And we went and got trained and became an Upward Church. And we did this thing and the community came like nuts. They were just like so hungry for this safe thing for their kid. And they didn't even mind that we were presenting the gospel every week to them and their parents. And it was awesome. And in about year three, four, five, some momentum had started to gain. And, and we started to have these closing kind of ceremony times. And this one year, we were going to have about 1,200 people there. And we were like, what, what do we do? And so we called up to ENC and uh, talked with uh, some of the basketball coaches. And they said, let's, let's send some players down. Let's run some clinics during that closing ceremony. Let's also send some of our chapel teams and summer men teams. And we'll run worship for you. And it was this awesome party all around basketball, but really for Christ. And people came to the Lord in numbers. It, it was really fun. But it was so exhausting. And so we had all these players and coaches down at our house. And by house, I mean, I mean, we call it a house. I guess the township called it a condominium. Others would walk into it and say it was more like a cottage. It was a cozy, nice space for four people. But once we got to about 24 people, we had reached well over max capacity. And they were staying all weekend. But it was awesome. I mean, literally, people were sleeping, like, in the tub, next to the tub, air mattresses all over the place. It was crazy and fun. But at the end of that, in the middle of the closing ceremonies, I get this text from the assistant chaplain here at ENC, and he says, hey, Stretch, we're on our way down to uh, Georgia. It's spring break, and we're taking about 16 kids from ENC on a fusion trip, and man, Philly would be a perfect rest stop for us for the night. <laughs> Any chance we could stay at your place? Well, I looked at the text and I realized I got bad reception in the church. And this text had come in hours and hours and hours before, but I was just getting it now. And they told me what time they were going to arrive, and that was about 3 p.m., and it was about 2.45 p.m. And I'm thinking, I probably should tell my wife. <laughs> but I can't find her anywhere. We close up, I forget, everything's good, I'm praying with people and we're celebrating, we're face painting, I'm high-fiving kids, and everything's good. I lock up, I get outside, and I look around, and I know I drove a car here, but that car's gone, and I know my wife drove a car, and that, that car's gone, and I know we have a third car, my daughter must have taken that one too, so there is no cars in the parking lot, and I'm stuck at the church, and I don't have a watch because it's not 1984 and I don't have my phone with me and I don't have my keys nor do I have my wallet oh I left them in the church and it's locked awesome and I literally am so tired and afraid to go home <laughs> that I sit down on the curb like this and I'm just like oh my goodness what a day and what's about to happen and how am I getting home? And what is happening? And all of a sudden, this car pulls around that I recognize. And it's Paul Stewart. And he's been my media guy all through Upward. And he's been here longer than I have. He got there at 5 in the morning. I got there at 6. I'm still here at 5 p.m. in the afternoon. And 
And he's still pulling around. And I go, Paul, what are you doing here? And he goes, dude, I like sleep here now. <laughs> he goes, but I love it, man. What a day. What an awesome day. Why are you here? Right? And I go, ah, oh, I, I, man, I can't even begin to. He goes, you look homeless, dude. <laughs> I go, well, I need a ride. He goes, get in. So then we start driving, and he goes, do you need to stop anywhere? And I go, oh, yeah, oh, my gosh, I'm supposed to bring dinner for a whole bunch of people. He goes, well, like, how many? I go, um, I think Jill called in the order to raise cheesesteaks. I think we got, like, 16 to 30-some people at the house. He goes, what? Your world is weird, dude. <laughs> and I go, well, just let's stop by Ray's. I'm sure she's called in there. So we get in there, and I go, oh, I don't, I don't have my, my wallet. Hey, Paul, can you? He goes, you're an idiot. Here, he pulls out his visa, and he just gives me it, right? Slaps it down. He's in the car. I go, you got a sign? He goes, forge my name. I'm like, okay, Paul Stewart. I walk out, I got sacks and sacks of cheesesteaks, onions just like falling all over me. It smells awesome. I'm so hungry. I go, let's go home. He takes me to my spot. We live in this cul-de-sac. Our house is filled with a lot of noise. And my neighbors, there's about five of them on this little dead end. We're the only ones under the age of, I don't know, 70. And so they're used to a nice quiet space. It looks a little like, um, did you ever hear of a movie called Animal House? Um, it looks a little like that. There's toilet paper in the trees. There's kids in the trees. There's music and vans are opened up and the ENC logo's all over the place, but the music is just pumping all over the place. And Paul, he drives down, he goes, dude, your life, it's not like mine. And I get out, and we, we drag everything in, and he goes, I just want to see what's happening. And he walks in the house, and he turns right around. <laughs> and I go, come on in. He goes, how? And I walked in, and there's 36 people, no kidding, in this cottage, and they're everywhere. They're sitting up on the counter space, like three up on our kitchen counter, like huddled up like this. And they're like, oh, yeah, food's here, yay. And people are standing on chairs and under chairs and all around Kids are sleeping, like they're just napping on their missions trip, like in the weirdest spots. And he's like, he just walks out and he just shook his head. He's like, dude, your life, it's not like mine. And he could, couldn't get out of there fast enough. Gets in his car, goes home. We spend the night trying to entertain, trying to do all the things that we do. I wake up early in the morning, get to church, and there's peace here at six in the morning. If you're looking for a quiet space in your week, man... This is a good spot. So I get to church and it's quiet. Well, not so quiet for Jill. She has to wake up and make breakfast for now 36 people. And she's running around and baking and coffee and doing all this stuff. And then in the middle of it goes, oh no, I'm on worship team today. And runs into the shower, gets dressed totally late, comes running in. And the whole worship team is up here. They're all around their mics and they're in their spots. Hey. Oh. Look at Jill. Oh, ha, 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 she's late. And the comments start coming, and they're all mic'd. And oh, oh, nice that the pastor's wife made it. Oh, hey, look, look, oh. Jill's time is different than everybody else's time, apparently. Oh, yeah, we said we'd be here at 845, but whatever, 915, girl. And we, we Christians, we have a way of... Using sarcasm is sort of our first language, don't we? And she's, I know, I know, I'm sorry, I know, I know, I know, I'm sorry. And she gets into her spot, you know, to join the worship team. And Paul Stewart is down fixing the, the monitor here because he's the media guy. And he stands up and he hears all that's happening and the comments continue to go and he just pulls her aside and he whispers something. And I didn't hear what he had to say. But I saw Jill do this. She went, oh. And then she sang her worship from her heart. And later I said, Jill, what, what did Paul say to you? And she immediately started tearing up after the service. And she said, Stretch, I had no idea that I needed what he had this morning. But you know what he said to me? He said, hey, Jill, they don't know. 
They have no idea what's going on at your house this weekend. They have no idea about your world. You let that go. You get here any good time you want. They don't know. You're fine. And he went back and he just fixed the monitor and went back up on the mezzanine and did his thing. And Jill said, I just, <gasps> just like breathe this sigh of like, I need it, that grace. And she said later, she said, it was like he wrapped a grace blanket around me and said, all is well. And this week, as I've been drinking in the scriptures through our lectionary, the Old Testament, the New Testament readings, the gospel readings, the Psalms, it's been leading us down this road of celebrating grace, this grace that God gives us that's so awesome. Remember a couple weeks ago, we talked about the, the mulligan that has offered us, like, ow, I just shanked that shot and it was awful. And what am I doing? And God says, hey, hey, let's do it again. Let's go again. And let's not dwell on that. Let that go. I haven't heard so much response from a sermon from the church as maybe the, um, the story from last week about my, um, my showing up to court looking like a two-bit clown with my purple sparkly lip gloss caked on when I had no idea that I was reapplying all day this this little girl, Bonnie Bell, standing before the judge just passionately trying to do my job and looking like a fool, and then later apologizing profusely and realizing what had happened. And I heard from so many of you this week that said, oh, that phone call from the judge must have been so awesome. When I played the voicemail and he just went, <laughs> we've all been there, young son. We've all been there. And I heard from so many of you saying, I've, I've experienced that. And oh, what a joy. Or, oh, I'm craving and could really use that type of voicemail, that grace-giving mulligan. And yet I'm challenged by the scripture that the Lord has brought to mind, and he may have just brought it to mind for me, I, I don't know. But in Matthew 7, verse 2, it says, be careful how you judge, and when you judge, judge according to the measure you would like to be judged on, and for the measure you use, it will also be used to you, and there's something about God that I want to put terms like completely unconditional on, and his love is. But the grace and the forgiveness seems different in the word. And it sobers me, it downright frightens me at times to think, so according to how much grace I give out, is going to be the measure God's able to bestow upon me. And then later in Matthew chapter 10, he says, freely I've given these gifts to you in order that you could freely give them away. And there was a grace gift given to my wife as she tried to find her way back into the worship team amidst the, the, the well-intentioned joking, but still the feeling of the, the guilt and the, the, all the pressure and the grace that was given so freely by someone who just happened to get a small little glimpse of the behind the scenes, Right? I'm sobered by how many times I've reacted to somebody who maybe was, was harsh or, 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 or rash, maybe even on the road, a passerby, that I maybe didn't even consider what they may have just come from. And I wasn't quick to extend them grace, but I was way more quick to say, hey, 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 like demanding my rights. 
Yet the first thing I want to do is when I come to the Lord is say, I'm going to need your grace and I'm going to need your mercy. And I'm, if I'm going to take any more steps closer to you, I'm going to need you to forget about a whole lot of stuff. And I receive it so freely, right? And yet, I can quickly get up out of my seat, walk out those doors, and forget that it was the whole reason he like, what did we read last week? That Paul says, God has poured out his grace on me. Me, the chief of all sinners, captain of the varsity sin team. And he's poured out grace on me in order for two things to happen so that Christ could be lifted up high, so that that cross could have real meaning, and that then we could be givers of grace. I've been so longing ever since I told that story last week and hearing many of your responses about that judge's response. I've been like, that's been my prayer, Lord. Make me, let my voice be the one of the judge that so quickly says, I get it. I'm with you. I see that and I've been there and I, I want to be able to give that type of grace. And I, side note, it's complicated though. Because I'm not really talking about pasting welcome on your chest and laying down and just being a welcome mat that people just continually walk on over and over and over again because that's called being taken advantage of and that's not really the call of the Christ follower. But it's complicated, right? Because I lay down my life and my rights and my privileges and I don't demand them anymore. But I don't want to continue into toxic relationships that continue to enable. And you look the other way feeling like it's grace, but in, inevitably you're just perpetuating a dysfunction. You want me to unpack that further, right? I mean, we should go deeper into that, right? But that, oh, that's a whole nother sermon, y'all. That's a whole nother series. That might take all semester because that, my friends, is complicated. This grace that is freely given and yet we have to be wise stewards too. Running back to an abusive relationship over and over and again just to become a punching bag is not what God had in mind. And yet, I want to extend grace and forgiveness with proper boundaries. I have good news for you in this side note. We used to sing a song about it. Sunday night church, somebody inevitably, it would usually be uh, Laura Cottis, would sit right about there and she would stand up and she'd say, let's sing the comforter has come. And she would just start to sing, the comforter has come, the comforter has come, the Holy Ghost from heaven, the Father's promise given. Oh, spread the tidings round, wherever men and women are found, the comforter has come. We now have the gift of the Holy Spirit, that has been gifted upon us, the promised one. Jesus said, with him, you can do even better things than me. And all the church says, come on. And yet it's true that when the comforter comes, he can actually give you discernment in this, right? But I'm, I've been praying this week, could, could our first language be? And those of you whose English is your second language, let me just quickly... Just say, I am in awe. This old dog has tried to learn other languages, and it is the hardest thing to do. And those of you who are digging out the work of trying to assimilate and figure out another language, that's awesome. I have so much respect for you because I know what it's like to try to acquire a different language. My first language is sarcasm. That's my first language. 
That's my first response to most situations is, is, is a sarcastic remark or, uh, you know, a, a biting commentary because ha, 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 isn't that funny? In stretch funny, ha, 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 funny. <laughs> you know what's funny? Hurtful words are often funny, but they hurt, right? And they don't extend grace and they don't, they don't look like Christ. They're certainly not, what, is, what does Paul call it? The aroma of Christ. And so this week I've just been praying, Lord, could grace be my first language? Could you change my culture, my instincts, so that that could be one of my first responses? I, I heard a story of a marital couple and um, I didn't want... I know what happens in small groups, I think, is supposed to stay in small groups, but my wife was teaching this small group, and she messed up. I was talking about grace and what I was going to share on Sunday, and she said, oh, you know, someone just shared a story about that, and she blurted it out, and halfway through, she went, oh, I'm not sure I was supposed to tell the pastor about that. I'm not, I'm not sure that was supposed to be. So I, I Facebooked that person, and I said, Jackie, would you be willing to share that story just with the church real quick, because... It was music. It felt like music to my ears. Just, just, just quickly, go ahead and uh, share that story. Uh, so um, my husband and I have been together for 15 years. And um, in the beginning of us becoming seriously dating, we had a huge argument. And uh, I'm a hothead between the two of us. So, uh, <laughs> my people. <laughs> and, um, and he's the more even. And after we had resolved the argument for hours afterwards, and then even like the next day, I was like, I'm really, I'm just sorry. I'm, I'm really sorry I behaved that way. I'm really sorry. And then a little while would go by, and I'd be come back, you know, I'm really sorry that that happened. I, I'm, I'm sorry. And at one point, Matt just stopped me and said, listen, I threw away the tape. I'm not going to play it again for you. I'm not going to rewind it. You're not going to hear it again. I threw away the tape. And then he has lived that way with me ever since. Wow. Wow. Did you catch that? Thanks. Did you really hear that? Because isn't that what happens, right? We do this thing, and then the tapes, they just play back, and they play back, and they play back. Oh, the enemy loves to push rewind. This is what he does. Rewind, play. You start to move forward. He goes, oh, no, no, stop. Rewind, play. One step forward. No, no, no. Remember who you are. Remember you're a hothead. Remember you said those words that you didn't really mean. There's no taking them back, and you got to beg for And the grace given by a loving man who just says, hey, I pushed erase on those tapes. And then I took them out, and I threw them away. You know what God says to us, right? Your sin Here's where I'm going to place it. Now that you've asked for forgiveness, here's where I'm going to place it. You see where the west goes? And as far as that goes, and you see where the east goes? As far as that goes. Yeah, whenever they meet, which is never, I'm going to place your sin right there at the place they meet. And I'll remember them no more. I'm going to just push, erase. Your sins are forgiven. And you can move on. And that grace, Jackie, wasn't it music to your ears? I, I remember Jill just standing there. Just, I could see her reaction. That's why I wanted to ask about it, to just say, so what did Paul say to you that just made you literally take a step back and go, oh, thank you. Is the grace given because it was freely given to us. We just sang about it, right? And now we get the opportunity, church, to go out those doors and freely give it away. I want to tell you a secret. Because it's a secret that Jesus revealed to people. And he was somewhat secretive in his stuff, and I kind of like that because the inner kid in me still wants to play like Blue's Clues or Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego or Where's Waldo? Like, go on a scavenger hunt and, and find out, like, what don't other people see that I could see? Jesus has this. 
You speak and live out grace like that, right? You push erase like that. You, you just grant grace like that. And you know what it does? It literally opens up God's faucet. And his glory just comes out. And I'm an old soul and kind of from the old school, but, but the glory of God is way old school, right? And when you hear people talk about it, don't you sort of just go, I don't, I don't know. I'm not even sure what that means. My southern friends talk about it. They're like, oh, the glory of God showed up in church today. And I'm like, mm, okay, all right. I'm from the Northeast. <laughs> well, well, skeptical. What did the glory of God look like, right? And yet you can hear it in Jackie's voice, can't you? When Matt pushes erase, he opens up the faucet and God just started to immerse their relationship. Didn't you guys start moving forward spiritually together? Didn't you start to feel God start to... Because then you start to look and act and walk and talk and smell like Christ. And he actually can show up and he starts infusing into your life. But it's subtle and it's awesome. Jesus talks about this like, like spy kind of thing. He, in fact, Soren Kierkegaard called himself a spy. He says, he says like, I, and it's just like grace. We Christ followers, we behave like spies, he says, living in one world, but our deepest allegiance is to another world. And in that other world, it operates differently. Look at what some of Christ says. He talks about, he gives all these images of the secret force that's happening. Sheep among wolves. Treasure hidden in a field. The tiniest seed in the garden having the largest impact. Wheat growing up right among the weeds. A pinch of yeast worked all the way in through the bread dough. A sprinkling of salt curing meat. All these hint at a movement that works within society through us, changing it from the inside out. You don't need a shovel full of salt to cure a ham. Just a, a dusting will do. And so it is with grace. That secret is one that if we tap into you will find tangible life change in your family, in your marriage, in your parenting, in your studies, in your relationship with your professor or your roommate, on your campus, in your workplace, on your team. When you realize that in that world, like we're in this world, but in the world where my deepest allegiance lies... In that world, grace is their native tongue. It's their first language there. Grace is, is the standard operating procedure. Grace is the default setting there. But here, it is not. And so don't be deceived that coming to church and hearing a nice word from that nice pastor in this nice church with all these nice people, it will not just flick a magical switch for you and you will become this grace-filled, smelling like the aroma of Christ kind of guy. No, you are going to have to make an intentional decision to look through eyes of love, to be spirit-filled so that you understand boundaries and know when it becomes a dysfunctional, toxic kind of grace, and when it is a spirit-filled, selfless kind of grace that is of that other world, you're going to have to really pray and seek God and your church attendance. I wish, 
I wish I could tell you to just grab the red folders and check the box that says grace filled. I, that's what I want to be this week. But it's not there. And I feel like, I don't know, I feel like you're going to need a little inspiration this morning. I feel like you're going to need a motivation to do this. This week, I, I, I found a motivational speaker that I think could inspire you to make the intentional decision to go out and do the hard work of changing your language. Let, let's hear from our motivational speaker. For me? <laughs> Love you. The beginning of the beginning. Turn that up, Mikey. But the great thing about this journey and the great thing about a race is that each and every part of it is just as important as the rest. Yeah, you might run faster at the beginning, or at the end, but with every step that you take, you make a decision. You decide just how much you're going to give. With every step, you decide how much you're going to give to yourself. You decide how much you're going to give to the sport. With every step, you decide how much you will give to this school. And with every motion, you decide what you will give to this team. And only you can make that decision. Mm. So the other day, I was invited to a brunch by one of the clubs on campus. And I walk in a few minutes late as usual. The doctor with voice in there, and he throws his hands up there and says, Great, I'm so glad you came. We have Donut King. Now, if you don't know what Donut King is and you've never been there, picture what a place called the Donut King would sell. Now we're on the same page. There you go. So I walk over to the table, and in front of me is a glorious display of two dozen Donut King donuts. And sitting there are half a dozen untouched butternut donuts. Now, to put this in perspective, each one of those donuts is probably about three times the size of a standard donut. So I embrace my inner blood and I grab two of those monsters and I sit down directly across from McCoy. Fast forward 10 minutes, I'm staring down at half a donut. My mind is screaming at me, Greg, you can't eat anymore, you have nothing left to give. <laughs> and you know what? <laughs> Dr. McCoy wouldn't have been disappointed if I didn't eat that half a donut. I hadn't stolen that donut from anyone. There was plenty left. But that half a donut would have haunted me. I knew that I could finish it. So, I conquered that donut. There was not a crumb left. <laughs> Friends, today, your mind will try to deceive you. Your mind will tell you to stop. It will tell you to slow down. It will tell you you have nothing left to give. When you hear those lies from your mind, think about that donut and know that you have more to give. Come on, bring it in. Woo! Today, we run because we choose to. Today, we run to test our perseverance. Today, we run to see exactly how much we have inside. Today, we run to the donut. Let's go! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, today is the day that we can respond in grace. We can give it away. We do it for more than just donuts. We do it for this king who has been immeasurably good to us. You know what First John tells us? He's lavished love on us. Paul says he poured out grace on us. Pastor Greg, thank you for the inspiration this morning. For not only do I want to run more for ENC, but I want us to be a church that changes their language so that their first language is one that starts to live in grace. You can do it, but you're going to have to make up your mind and everything that Greg was telling you about the physical battle is the same in the spiritual battle. It will war against you this week. And you will be cut off in that lane. And you will have established your right to that lane. And that person will be out and out wrong. And maybe you'll remember all the times you unknowingly cut off all those other people. I, I feel like, oh, I was traveling back from vacation this week and a cop came up behind me with his lights. And you know that pit in your stomach you get, right? And you go, oh, no. And I look down at my, my speedometer, and I'm not speeding. And I'm like, what's the problem? Because Im immediately, if there's a cop out on the street, he must be chasing me. 
the world revolves around me, right? And I go, oh, no. And he comes right up behind me, stays there, and then he cuts out and takes off. And I was like, oh, whew. And I looked over. I was going to say it to Jill, but she was asleep. And I said to myself, you know what? Had I gotten a ticket, I'm probably overdue. It's about 20 years since I've gotten a speeding ticket, and I'm pretty sure I've earned a speeding ticket multiple times since then. So in reality, and I started to feel like, man, I need to remember that when I hold others' charges against them. And to remember what the judge reminded me and what many of you shared your story and what a loving husband can say to his wife to say, I, I've been there and I understand and I, I've made those errors before. And I, while I don't want to enable chaos in your family, I do want us to think, man, what if our first response became grace and love and wouldn't? It be then true, what did Jesus say, how he would know you are his disciples? Because you wear the t-shirt that says, I'm Jesus' disciple, right? No, because that t-shirt's kind of corny. And the world goes, man, you know what's really attractive to the world? That they will know you are his disciples by your love. And is there any better expression than the grace that we've been freely given to then go out and freely give it away? Greg says we can do it. I think we can do it. And today, you should go over to Donut King and get a donut. That's inspired me as well. A butternut donut as big as my head sounds awesome right about now. Today, we're going to leave this place. And I hope that many of you will find your way to a small group. Last week, we kicked off the new semester of small groups, and uh, almost 300 of you found your way to a space. I'm so proud of you, church. I'm so very proud of you. Way to take a hold of the challenge to say, man, I just don't want to spectate in worship and, and just enjoy that and consume that but I also want to go the extra mile and kind of make a deeper connection here. I'm so proud of you college students saying, you know what? I spent enough time in my dorms and I spent enough time over the gym in class. I would love to connect on a deeper level. You may notice, college students, that there isn't a college class per se. That was on purpose because I remember as a student being here, Man, I felt like my whole world was college. The dorm was college. The calf was college. The, the dugout, the, the snack bar was college. Everybody, everybody I rode with was in college. And once in a while, I felt like it was really cool if I could connect to a bigger world and to some Christians who are a little bit further down the road. And so that's really my hope and my prayer. And I was so thrilled as I read through some attendance things this week, just, just praying over it and just celebrating that so many of you have said, yeah, and I, I'm joining into that class, that group, that small group over there, because I just, I want to go a little deeper. We'll do that till about December 11th. And then college kids, you're going to go home for Christmas break. Here at Wollaston, we're going to take a little respite, just a little Sabbath. Teachers are going to breathe. We, uh, we small groupers are going to breathe a little bit, enjoy the holidays. And then about January 15th, we're going to kick it off for the winter and spring semester and, and regroup. And it's going to be awesome. You heard uh, Mary Kay say that some of those groups were a little too big for the space that was in there. So we had to reshuffle some of them. So look in your uh, worship folder and see if your small group has a new classroom number. It might be in Gardner, it might be in Angel, it might be here at the church. Take a look. Um, you, can, you can probably get some information out at the coffee bar back out there in the welcome desk. And if you're really lost, come and find me. We'll be lost together. I will figure it out. But I would love for you, even if you haven't signed up, you didn't know which one to pick, jump in to a smaller group. Debrief this life that we have together because our allegiance lies somewhere else. It's lonely out there. You get out there and you're working in the real world and you're thinking, man, I want to give grace and I want to be the aroma of Christ. And you look around and you go, is anybody with me? 
And it can be tough, right? But here on Sundays, we get a chance to just breathe and refresh and go, oh, yeah, look around. I got a whole family that's with me. And we kind of recharge our batteries to go out and be agents of grace. Father, we love you. We're yours. Everything we have, everything we've got, everything we're not, we're all yours. See if we can be completely yours now, Lord. Would you infuse us with the Holy Spirit so that our language, our actions, our thoughts, our expression of love can be so grace-filled that they will know that this dark, lost, confused, violent world will know that we are Christians, Christ followers, because of our love. Freely, you've given us. And so freely, we want to give it away. Help us, Lord. Fill us with the Holy Spirit so that we can have the mind of Christ to have discernment to even know what are the boundaries and uh, how far, all of those questions that get so complicated. Lord, would you interpret to our souls? You are our master, our Lord. We are thrilled with you. And we give you the honor and the praise. Continue meeting with us as we break into our small groups and our huddles all around campus. And would you continue to share with us your word? We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.